so we'll start off with uh, lecture 3 now and then we're going to talk more about uh, the thermal uh, power plants uh, today we're going to look into more of the thermodynamics part of the same so uh, if we just uh, look into this uh, we are just going to start with the basic uh, idea of the Rankine cycle uh, I think the last class we ended at uh, a point where we wanted to start with the Rankine cycle all of you uh, must have uh, already studied a bit about uh, Carnot cycle in your uh, lower class uh, thermodynamics uh, even might be in a part of chemistry but uh, Rankine cycle is something which resembles the Carnot cycle but nevertheless I am going to explain Carnot cycle as well so uh, if you talk about uh, Rankine cycle there are four parts to it as you can see uh, there is a turbine there okay and then there is a generator and then there is a condenser and then there is a pump and then there is a boiler so if you look into the cycle part uh, the three things the four things that you need is a turbine okay a condenser a pump and a boiler so we're going to include these four and look into the Rankine cycle closely so the electrical power that is being generated by using the vapor cycle powers plant and the source of uh, fuel that they use are coal lignite diesel uh, heavy furnace oil okay so, and so on so so we have seen that uh, part in the last class and talked about different types of coals that are possible so uh, it also depends upon the probability or the availability and the cost of the fuel that is uh, actually needed so if we just uh, look into this uh, power plant uh, subsystem it can be classified into four categories last class also we have done that but uh, this time i've just uh, put it a bit more details there so what we say is that it can be classified uh, uh, for the subsystem a it is basically comprising the main component what is the main component and uh, that's the turbine the condenser the pump and the boiler okay and that is what is needed for the uh, power generation and based on this we have got the Rankine cycle so the Rankine cycle is based on this okay then we have got uh, subsystem b okay and subsystem b is basically something which uh, throws out the excess exhaust and that's uh, basically connected with the stack or the chimney uh, and the subsystem c we have uh, the electrical generator so the last class we have discussed about alternator if you can remember that and that is where we have converted the mechanical energy into electrical energy in subsystem d uh, classified as uh, the cooling water system so whatever water has been uh, uh, used up in the system in the turbine uh, that needs to be cooled down so that is the cooling water system and that is basically for absorbing the heat of the rejected steam so basically we are going to use the same steam cool it down and then again heat it up to generate uh, more uh, steam okay so that's your subsystem d so these are the four subsystems so uh, the question might be what are the power plant subsystem please explain uh, it might be if it's an objective uh, question probably a two marks question and if you just need to explain a bit more uh, probably i can add uh, two mark more to that so that might be a four mark question for you okay so uh, what is an ideal Rankine cycle so now you understand the term ideal here because we are saying that something which is uh, uh, needed but uh, it might not be possible in the real life uh, scenario okay so when we have basically in a vapor cycle we basically have the vapor which is basically the working fluid so it passes through uh, various uh, components of the power plant uh, without irreversibility and frictional pressure drop that means there is zero loss okay? uh, because if some of the steam uh, goes into the turbine if the entire steam can be converted back into the water to again convert it into steam and throw it into the turbine that means that is an ideal Rankine cycle but that obviously doesn't happen because some work is done in the form of work some amount of uh, input is definitely lost so we don't have a hundred percent efficiency if we have a hundred percent efficiency that means there will not be their power plant uh, the frictional pressure drop won't be there and then it will call be as a uh, ideal Rankine cycle okay so 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 we need to remember this line okay the cycle passes through various component of the power plant without irreversibility and frictional pressure drop okay so uh, then we'll come back uh, to the Rankine cycle and you have to please remember these basically starts at the boiler next is goes to the turbine then it goes to the condenser and then it basically have the pump so uh, there are two places where the work is done once one is here 
we have the work done in the turbine and one is in the pump okay so we have the pump which um, uh, drags the water uh, from the condenser back to the boiler so the Rankine cycle is the basic operating cycle of all power plant where a uh, working fluid is continuously uh, changing its uh, phase from liquid to vapor and vice versa right so we're continuously changing it from liquid to vapor then vapor again changes back to liquid again fed into the boiler then it becomes a liquid then again it's boiled and then there is a steam and then it keeps on going okay so that's basically why it is called a cycle here so if you just look into the thermodynamics uh, we have a lot of things uh, that we need to revise so just uh, let's revise a bit of thermodynamics here and i'm sure all of these you uh, remember these uh, basic concepts because this has been also been taught in your lower classes even in school level it's important okay so the first term that we should know is basically an isothermal process in an isothermal process there is no change of temperature so if a system goes a thermodynamic process where there is no change of temperature we basically call it as isothermal process now if you all remember this term or uh, this equation pv is equal to nrt okay so these from here you basically get uh, three parts here the pressure the volume and uh, the temperature okay so uh, that is uh, important these are the thermodynamic quantities but we also have some other thermodynamic quantities like enthalpy entropy and so on okay so what we have here is basically a uh, isothermal process the next term that we should know is something which is called as an adiabatic process now in an adiabatic process uh, if, we, if we have a system if we have a system mm, uh, there is no heat exchange with the surrounding okay so if there is a heat exchange we say uh, there is no heat exchange okay so that is what is uh, basically an adiabatic process here and uh, it occurs without transferring any heat or of course there is no change of mass also okay the most important equation for an adiabatic expression is pv to the power gamma is a constant where gamma is basically called the molar gas constant okay so i hope all of you remember this this is a molar gas constant okay and it depends on what kind of gas it is okay it's a diatomic gas or a monoatomic gas and so on okay so uh, between a thermodynamic system okay so it, it it basically uh there is no exchange uh, uh, uh the, this is actually a continuation of the sentence uh, without transferring heat or mass between the thermodynamic system and the surroundings okay so thermodynamic system and the surrounding there is no exchange there okay so that's isothermal and adiabatic process the next uh, quantity is entropy that we should remember okay first i hope you remember this expression ds is equal to dq by t if you're giving any kind of entrance exam and thermodynamics is in your syllabus then this is very important part you see uh, this is also there and you can see that dq is there okay so in case this uh, dq is equal to zero if dq is equal to zero then ds is also zero right ds is also a zero here so if you go back here uh, if we just uh, we just uh, go back there okay if we go back here what we see here is that uh, in an adiabatic process there is no exchange of heat so if there is no exchange of heat then uh, dq would be zero right if dq is zero then we say ds is zero so we can say in an entropy if there is a uh, entropy is uh, considered it is somewhere related with the exchange of heat also so we need to understand this also okay so we're going to see it in the red kind cycle so what you see is an entropy is basically a thermodynamic quantity that represents the availability of the system's thermal energy okay for conversion into mechanical energy so how much energy or the thermal energy the system has for conversion into mechanical energy is termed as entropy uh, it's more appropriate to say in general we say that it measures the degree of disorderness or randomness of the system okay next we have got something which is called isentropic process uh, this is something which is not used very frequently but this isentropic uh, process is again uh, dependent on the constant of entropy of the system so if the entropy of the system is constant okay so please remember this if entropy is constant means the change in entropy would be zero so if the change in entropy is zero then we can say it is an isentropic process okay so it's indirectly a part of adiabatic process because in an adiabatic process dq becomes zero then ds becomes zero right we're going to see that it's a special case of adiabatic process and that's why we call it as a special case of adiabatic process and it is defined as a reversible adiabatic process so it's reversible in nature an objective question for two marks might be what is the isentropic process please remember that if i'm giving any kind of questions for your exams uh, whatever is there in the slide will be a part of the syllabus okay even if it is for your basic understanding and basic knowledge okay so don't ignore that okay 
uh, and uh, for uh, adiabatic process pv to the power gamma is equal to constant and for is isentropic process also pv to the power gamma is equal to constant okay now please try to listen to this uh, slides uh, in, in case you are not getting it or i am being a bit fast or you can just definitely slow it down or listen it listen to this again and just make your own notes a thermodynamic quantity uh, which is equivalent to the total heat content of the system now if the we consider the amount of heat that is present in the system that will be actually a, a combination of the internal energy okay or the internal heat okay and of course the work done okay so on the work done so what we have is that total quantity is basically called the enthalpy so enthalpy is usually denoted by h please remember the notation here okay we are going to use this h later might be a small uh, um, um, smaller uh, value or in a smaller range we are going to use but enthalpy is denoted by h and we have this is nothing but internal energy plus p into v where p is pressure and v is the volume okay so u is not denoted in written here but use the internal energy as in any thermodynamic system okay now let's just uh, recall uh, carnot cycle okay let's just recall uh, carnot cycle if all of you don't remember it uh, very clearly so what happens in a carnot cycle is we have an engine or we have a system and let's say we have got a piston here right so if you remember this piston system here and then we have got some gas involved here okay and then uh, there are uh, four parts to it so in the first part what we do we put it in a heat source okay we have a heat source and then let's say we have this okay and so we have got uh, heat here okay so heat is here and let's say here it is ice okay so this is the sink which absorbs the heat okay this is the ice and this this particular process it's just, just plain okay it doesn't uh, have the heat or the source here heat or the sink sorry so this is the first process in the first process what happens please try to remember this it's a not a very difficult concept there is an isothermal expansion okay so there is an isothermal expansion here so in isothermal expansion what happens uh, there is no uh, change of uh, temperature so the temperature basically remains constant so what happens is if you take the gas and you put it here on top of this uh, heat okay if on top of this what will happen this will actually expand the piston will expand and it will reach here let's say and then the gas or whatever is there will expand so if it expands that means the volume is expanded so you see this is plotted between volume and pressure volume and pressure so the volume expands so the volume increases so volume goes from 1 to 2 so the volume increases what happens to the pressure the pressure definitely drops because if the piston expands it has more volume to uh, cover on the same amount of gas so that means the pressure will definitely drop okay and there is no change of temperature here that's why it's isothermal expansion why no change of temperature because even if you heat the system uh, the gas expands okay and it takes that much of space okay? so it's basically uh, not uh, increasing the temperature of the system by system we mean this okay the piston is basically your system very important next what we do we call talk from go from two to three so that is adiabatic expansion so in adiabatic expansion what happens so we basically take this okay and we'll place it here okay and we'll place it here and we will see that the gas will uh, still keep uh, keep on expanding if it expands then definitely the volume increases but this time please remember the volume expansion is not that much but there is a large pressure drop here but there is a large pressure drop here okay the only uh, the difference here is that the adiabatic expansion there is no exchange of heat now you can see if you place it here this is one uh, one to two okay one to two and this is let's say two to three two to three now if you put it here back in from two to three you see that there is no heat there is no there is no source as such and there is no sink so that means you have just kept it here without any external uh, heat so that means uh, there is no exchange of heat and hence it is an adiabatic expansion next what we do we will bring it here so it will be 3 to 4 here will be going here okay so what will happen is 3 to 4 we will be keeping it in the uh, sink so sink we can say that basically it is a ice bath okay we have some ice there okay and then what happens um, the piston is uh, pushed back now now the piston is moved in this direction if the piston is moved in this direction there is compression right there is compression that means the gas gets compressed here and that is called isothermal compression now you will say that okay that isothermal compression the temperature should remain constant yes that's true whatever heat is generated is given to the ice 
as a result of which the temperature of this uh, piston or the system remains the same okay it is given to this and compression because obviously the gas is compressed okay and finally we go from 4 it was in the fourth state and then it will go back to 1 again it will go to the original state. So, what happens here is we are going to take this back here, okay. We are going to take this back here, and now what is going to happen is uh, uh, the volume you see the volume has reduced here, okay. It will further reduce, okay, and then definitely there will be some kind of temperature which is involved because the pressure is put in, okay. So, we have uh, uh, pressurized it even further, and then the pressure keeps on increasing and the volume reduces and then we have got an adiabatic compression because because of that there is no change or exchange of heat with the surrounding okay and that happens not here sorry uh, this is wrong okay it should be here it should be here we're going back here not this okay not this so maybe i should drop this so we will go from four to one and we'll put it back here and we'll get that state okay so get that state so this is basically what is a carnot cycle uh, you can uh, go back uh, to your uh, uh, earlier ideas and you can read it from the net and all you will get a lot of information. But if you look into this image you should be able to remember what is a Carnot cycle and uh, I have explained a very basic idea of the Carnot cycle. Okay? Why we need to know this because next we are going to look into the Rankine cycle. So if you look into the Rankine cycle what we see is that there is a boiler okay? and there is a boiler let us say this is let us say this is 2 right you can say this is 2. Okay? And then what happens is uh, boiler, uh, we are getting the steam here and it is going to go into the turbine. Okay. So, what happens is the you can look into this now one by one here. Now, the energy balance in the boiler or is the energy added to the steam generator Q in is equal to H3 minus H1. Now, what was my H? H was this H. Okay. This H was enthalpy. So, that means the total heat that is present in the system. Okay. So, um, what happens is we have, uh, uh, we let us let's explain the cycle here. So, we have the steam which comes into the turbine and then the remaining steam which can be used, it goes back to the condenser, condenses, gets back into the water and then that water is pumped back into the boiler again for again regenerating the heat. Okay. So, whatever is H3 is nothing but the heat that we have here. So, this is your heat H3 what we have here and then H1 is nothing but here. Okay. So, if you look to the energy balance of the boiler because there will be some kind of loss. So, if you subtract H3 minus H1, you get what is the heat which is added to the boiler. Okay. Next, work done by the turbine. Now, there are two parts where the work is done. One is done in the turbine and one is done in the pump. Okay. Please remember this. One is done in here and one is done here. Okay. So, the first work is done in the turbine. So, what we are doing, we are going one by one. Okay. So, let us mark this as one. So, this is or let us mark this as A rather. Okay. We will mark this as A here so that it is easy to remember. This is A. So, this is A. Okay. This is the first part. Okay. Done. Next, what happens is 2. The two second part is there is a work done by the turbine. So, what we have is work turbine out. Okay. So, that is given out as an output. So, this is nothing but H3 minus H4. So, we have got H3 and we have got H4 here. Okay. So, that is your B. So, that is your B. Okay. So, let us mark this here as B. Okay. Next, what we have is the energy rejected in the condenser. So, next we have got the energy rejected into the condenser. So, in the condenser what we have is food is here. Okay. This is the fourth process. So, there is some kind of heat which is there and then we have got H5 which is there. Okay. So, we will take this as number C. So, this is your number C. Okay. Next, we have got work done on the pump okay so the work has been done on the pump and because of which the water actually rises to the boiler so here pump in we have got h1 minus h5 so we have got h1 and this is your h5 okay so we've got h1 minus h5 so these are the four cycles that we have and this comprises the Rankine cycle okay so if you plot a graph between let's say temperature and uh, entropy what happens is let us uh, start from here you see very little work is done from 5 to 1 very little work is done from uh, 5 to 1 okay and then it rises to the boiler and from 1 if we start the cycle it goes from 1 to 2 so that means at uh, this state 1 this much is the temperature and this much is the entropy and as we go from 1 to 2 okay okay 
we have got this as from here so that means from here to here it's going okay so what happens is uh, from here to here there is a rise of temperature and there is a slight change of entropy also okay so we already know what is the term entropy here but when it goes from 2 to 3 okay so when it goes from 2 to 3 here what happens is the entropy will remain uh, will increase and the temperature will remain the constant so basically it's an adiabat uh, sorry isothermal process okay so this is an isothermal process okay or 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 in general we can uh, talk about uh, this okay and then what happens uh, when it goes from uh, 3 to 4 okay when it comes back from 3 to 4 you can see that the entropy will remain constant but the temperature will drop so it is no more an isothermal process since the entropy changes this will become an adiabatic process okay so here we have got uh, isothermal process okay and here let me write it down as an adiabatic process because you see there is a constant entropy if the entropy is constant which is basically nothing but uh, adiabatic or in general we can say the isocentric right so if, if you remember this okay can we just go back and we just go back here once okay. so uh, yeah isentropic okay so can you see this term okay this is ts is equal to zero which i have explained before so this here becomes isentropic okay so this will become isentropic okay. let me just write it down isen okay and then what happens it goes back from uh, 4 to 1 okay so it goes back from uh, 4 to 1 it goes back from 4 to 1 where the entropy will uh, reduce okay the entropy will reduce okay and the temperature will remain the same okay so it again becomes the isothermal process so it becomes the isothermal process so this is basically a cycle of uh, isotropic mm, isothermal and isentropic process okay and if you look into the Carnot cycle, it is basically a cycle of isothermal and adiabatic expansion. Okay, and here we have got isothermal expansion, isothermal, isothermal expansion, isothermal compression. Okay, adiabatic uh, expansion. Okay, and then adiabatic compression and so on. So, so basically, this uh, or isentropic. I should say isentropic. I should not use the term adiabatic here. We should use the term isentropic. So you can see that there is a direct relation between the Carnot cycle and the Rankine cycle okay so in the Rankine cycle you have to remember what is happening at A, B, C and D. Now if you go back to Carnot cycle and if you remember the efficiency of a Carnot cycle in general efficiency is nothing but eta okay is equal to nothing but output divided by input okay. So it is generally denoted as 1 divided by Q2 divided by Q1 okay. So if you remember this and based on this we are also going to uh, know what is the efficiency of a Rankine cycle. So what we have here is nothing but uh, output divided by input okay so in a Rankine cycle the efficiency is given by q in minus q out okay divided by the q input okay so that means uh, in general we can say the efficiency is nothing but the net work done divided by the input okay so whatever is the output divided by input so if we just write down in general eta so it is nothing but uh, output now input out by in so we have got out by in and then if you look here we have got this one is output by input so what is the uh, output output is nothing but the network that is being done okay and the network is of obviously affected by the uh, at the point where the pump raises this okay so this is the uh, uh, this is the work done which affects it so this is denoted as w in okay so we basically write it down as w3 to 4 so you remember let's check this 3 to 4 here okay so if you look into from uh, 3 4 okay so we can see this this is the work done 3 to 4 that is the maximum work done and then this is nothing but uh, for 1 to 5 okay let's see what notation we have been yeah 5 1 okay so we've got w 3 4 minus w 5 1 okay and divided by q 1 3 okay so that's there okay and q 1 3 why q 1 3 because this is the input right so q 1 3 is the input so we have got here 1 and then this is 3 okay this is 1 and this is 3 and that was the input there this is the input that goes in and then there is work done in two places here and here okay and then we can actually find out w34 minus w51 is equal to q13 okay so this you need to remember and that is basically what we call as the thermal efficiency of the rankine cycle so it's basically a four way process that we need to understand here and uh, the efficiency of a power plant or a station actually depends on what is the capacity of the installed plant okay 
So the overall efficiency of the steam plant is defined as the ratio of the equivalent, uh, this is important, ratio of the equivalent heat of the electrical output to the heat of the combustion of the coal. So what we have is output by input. So this is your output, the electrical output and the combustion of the coal or the heat that the coal can generate is basically nothing but the input. And if you take a ratio of that, you get the uh, thermal efficiency. So the overall efficiency actually varies from 20% to 26%, but we have to also understand that it actually depends upon the plant's capacity. So if I give you a multiple choice question uh, um, uh, in the next exam that I am going to conduct online, I might ask you that it depends on which factor, okay. And I can give you four different options. So it basically depends upon the plant capacity, okay. So if the plant is capacity is only 1 megawatt, uh, the, the efficiency would be just 4%, okay. So these range you should remember, okay, that is also something which you should remember that's why I've given you this table here. So if you look into this, uh, this is there and then if it's above 1 megawatt up to 10 megawatt, the efficiency can be as good as 12 percent and uh, finally if it is very high that means above 100 megawatt we can get an efficiency up to 27 percent. In general in thermal power plant this kind of efficiency is not considered bad okay it's still fine acceptable. So, uh, what are the requirements of the construction of a thermal power plant? Now, this is uh, very much uh, theoretical, okay. This is uh, very much uh, theoretical. Now, the electric uh, power uh, generation, plant uh, generation must be constructed at a such a place where the cost of land is quite reasonable, okay. So, we need to obviously look into the budget and the cost of land should be low. And the land uh, should uh, be uh, such that the acquisition of private property must be minimum. See, basically it requires a lot of resources. So, we do not need to uh, disturb the private livelihood and that is why the private requirement should be lesser. And a, coil, a large quantity of cooling water is definitely required. So, that is why the thermal power plant should be actually uh, near, preferably near a big source of natural source of water such as a river, okay. Uh, so, it should be uh, near, this should be done near a natural source such as a big river. Now, that is always advisable. The availability of a uh, huge uh, amount of fuel at reasonable cost, obviously, you need a lot of fuel at a reasonable cost, it is important. And then uh, it should be established on a plain land, obvious reasons, okay. The soil should be such that it should provi provide good and firm foundation of the plant and building. See, it is not a short term plan, it is a long term investment. It needs to be there for a number of years uh, for uh, service and giving service to the society. So, it is important that it is in such a place that it can stay okay because if there is any kind of accident that may happen because of uh, natural calamity or of the bad quality of the land uh, then that that then uh, incurs a lot of loss the thermal power plant location should be very near should not be very near okay so the term is should not okay the not term is very important to a dense locality okay because obviously it generates a lot of smoke noise stream water vapors and so on okay so, there must be ample scope of development of future demand. Definitely, if there is the need to expand, there should be ample space nearby so that it can be expanded and other resources should also be available then and there. A place for ash handling plant for thermal should be available very nearby. Now, there is a lot of ash which is generated. If you remember the last class I told you about coal, it generates a lot of ash, okay, which is actually not uh, productive enough. We do not can't reuse it. So, definitely we need to handle it. So, we should uh, be having a, a proper place to dispose that off as well, okay. It will have very tall chimney of power station and should not of obstruct the traffic of airships. So, obviously, it should not be somewhere near the city, should be far from the city so that the um, uh, normal uh, life is not disrupted because of this, okay. So, with this, we will uh, stop today. In the next class, we are just going to look into some advantages and disadvantages of thermal power plant and carry on with the next topic. Thank you.